Well, thank you, Zach. It is good to be back with all of you guys. A lot of familiar faces. I know I'm connected with a lot of you on Facebook already, a handful of you are clients, so it's great to be here, meet a lot of you in person for the first time. So what I'm going to be talking about today is Mark gave a great presentation this morning about defeating the evil empire. So I'm going to give you the tools and show you how to do that by leveraging technology. The fact that the ROI of social media is that your business will exist in five years. Like Mark said, the industry as we know it is dead. And if you don't adapt, you're not going to be around to do business. So that's why it's so important to get on these networks and start communicating. This isn't a fad. Social media is revolutionizing the way we communicate. The internet is changing the way the game is played. So here's some information about me. I know I'm connected to uh, quite a few of, already, uh, of you already on Facebook. Uh, connect with me on Twitter. This is our, our, our company one. I also have Amy McElwain as my personal Twitter. Get connected. That's the best way to really get a feel for this. You know, connect with me, see what I'm doing. The same stuff that I'm doing is what I'm teaching you, my clients, to do. So how did I get involved in this strange little world financial social media? It's a weird niche. Well, my background, back in the late 90s, I started out doing web design. It was my freshman year in college, and that year I learned web design. I spent the summer traveling Europe, designing websites in exchange for free accommodation at hostels. The next year I learned search engine optimization, and the process repeated itself. And while my career path has taken quite a few different directions, I wound up in the financial industry selling advertising space for Senior Market Advisor magazine, which goes out to a lot of annuity producers. And what happened there is I slowly saw the decline in the traditional media. The print ads just weren't working anymore. So I started seeking out new ways to get leads and generate business for my clients and found social media as going back to my roots in online marketing. And I left a couple years ago and started a financial social media. We're a boutique firm based in Denver, Colorado. We have eight employees right now. And we work specifically with financial advisors and insurance agents. So that's a little bit about me and where I came from. And while the travel thing is kind of random for me to add in there, that's what social media is about. It's about connecting with people in a different level and building relationships. So you want to, in all of your networks and anything you're doing, you want to bring your personal life in this as well because that's really going to help build relationships with your clients and that's what the direct channel can't do. They can't take that away from you. They can't take that personal. So here's some, what we're going to cover today. You know, what is social media exactly? Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, you hear all these networks thrown around, but what is social media? And more importantly, why should you care? You know, then what to communicate in the social networks? Are you just putting out financial statistics? No. So we're going to talk about what generates responses and how to engage. We're going to talk about where to start how to stay compliant. Can I see a raise of hands how many people are registered reps? Brokers? Okay, good handful of you. So we're going to touch on that briefly, um, some of the things you need to do to make sure you're staying compliant. And then how to incorporate these and where to really start. So I'm going to give you four real life examples and go step by step how you can do this through social media. All right, so first, what exactly is social media? Like I just mentioned, you hear Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of these things are just thrown around. Well, according to Wikipedia, social media is, transferring, is uh, transforming media monologues into social media dialogues. In other words, it's a fancy way to describe the zillions of conversations taking place online every day. Facebook, Twitter, that's the networks in which this happens, but it's these conversations and the content is what matters. Here's some statistics. from This is from the month of March, this recently. You can see Facebook had over 7 billion visits in one month. That's huge. And this is actually a pretty significant month because this newer network called Pinterest, some of you might have uh, thought, heard of it before, P-Interest, or Pin, it's Pinterest, but it jumped up. It overtook LinkedIn as the third largest network. That's how quickly this is going. And this community Communication is changing, and if you don't get on now, you're not going to be able to play catch-up because it's going to continue to evolve. 
And here's how that matters. This is a clip I took from my website. This is from our Google Analytics. Just grabbed the snapshot two weeks ago. This shows how much traffic we're getting and how much is a direct result of social media. As you can see, we're getting about 3,700 unique visits per month, and about a third of them are from social media. And this is organic. This is free. This isn't any paid search. If you've ever looked into the Google advertising, like the uh, pay-per-click stuff, you could pay a dollar per click on the cheap end. That would cost you $1,200. And this is all free through social media. Building these networks, driving the traffic. So let's go into the networks in a little detail. LinkedIn. LinkedIn is, you know, I notice most business professionals usually start out on LinkedIn. There's a comfort level there. It is perceived more the business place to be an environment for you to network in. And it's a big network. There's over 120 million people on LinkedIn. And these are the people that you actually want to be in front of. Because check out their financial pro uh, profile here. They have an average household net worth of over a hundred, or average household income over a hundred thousand dollars. So these are the types of clients that you want. And here's how you can use it. You know, if you have a client in your office, maybe go and look them up on LinkedIn. Maybe you went to the same college. Maybe you have similar hobbies. Maybe you know some of the same people because it's about trust. And people are going to be doing business with you because they trust you, they have common interests, and because they like you. So that's a great way to do it. And then the reverse is true. They're probably going to Google you. I mean, before they're investing all their money, and if they're not, their kids are. So what shows up when somebody Googles you? The way search engine optimization works, these social media profiles are going to be one of the first things that shows up. So here's an example. And let's do Lee Hyder here. We Google Lee's name. <laughs> let's see what comes up. You can see his home page, Lee Hyder, Lee Hyder. Oh, there's his LinkedIn profile. It's like number four down. There's, you know, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Twitter, right there. All of these are the first things that come up if you Google his name. So that's why it's important to have a presence on these profiles and to make sure they look professional. Now on to Twitter. Is that, is that it on LinkedIn? What, what kind of uh, action or activity is done on LinkedIn? I just see it as a, as a collective directory of people. I don't see a lot of interaction. You know, there's a ton that you can do on LinkedIn because you're looking at like this. You think of LinkedIn as, you know, you're going and you're setting up a booth at this trade show. That's your profile. And if you don't talk to anybody, nothing's going to happen. So you have to interact and engage in these groups. The, uh, the posting, like, posting, status updates. Yeah. Yep. Updates. Mm -hmm. Yep. Reading the status updates, participating in the groups, and I'm going to I'm going to go into more depth on all of these oh. and give you solid examples. So if you want to hold your questions till the end, make a list. I'll be doing Q and A at the end, so you guys can. Just take note. Okay, now on to Twitter. Twitter, I get the most pushback about this one. People are struggling to understand how this network, how celebrities are out there tweeting about what they had for lunch. How is that going to help you as a financial professional? But used correctly, Twitter is such a powerful business tool. Um, you know, but the more and more people are getting on Twitter every day, but you just need to know how to use it. Like with all of these networks, there's going to be this aha moment when all of a sudden it starts clicking and making sense. Twitter is a great traffic driver. It's great for finding real-time information, following what's happening right now. There's two to three new accounts are created every second. It's every second. So growing fast. So what does a professional Twitter account look like? Well, this is Mark's right here. So you need to have a nice background image. You need to use keywords in your title up top that he wants to be recognized for. And then you want to grab your name. This is a really interesting thing I'm noticing about Twitter. It's like email. Remember when email first came out and everyone kind of grabbed the fun names? I remember I was upper 90 at AOL.com because I'm a soccer player. But then everyone started switching and you, I grabbed Amy McElwain at Gmail or Brian Smith at Hotmail. You want to grab your name. 
That's what's happening with Twitter. There's more than just a, a, the individuals have it. The companies have a presence, but now all of the individuals within the company are having a Twitter handle, and it's becoming this new form of communication. And I'm seeing it. it it's if you look at any news station, it's all the reporters also have a Twitter handle in addition to Channel 9 News. So it's a great way to get in touch with these people and, and connect with them because with Facebook and LinkedIn, they have to accept you as a friend. With Twitter, you can just follow them and you can retweet their information and you can get in front of them and catch their attention, which can be really beneficial when reaching out to the media. 41% of business owners say Twitter gives great value. I'm willing to bet the other 60% do not know how to use it properly. <laughs> and I, have, I was one of them in the beginning. I had started a Twitter account four years ago. And this Twitter's been around for six years, so it's one of the more of the early adapters. And I was following the books, doing everything I read, going through the motions. But I really just didn't get it. And I didn't really know if it was working. And it wasn't until I started a personal account that I started to understand. I'm going to go back to the travel thing. My personal one, I started with like backpacker girl or something like that. So I started following travel bloggers and starting to use it from a consumer perspective so I could get my hands around this. And it really clicked to me. I was recently down, I was in Buenos Aires in Argentina for the month of January. And in the month of January, something's going on called playoff football. And my Cincinnati Bengals, born and raised in Cincinnati and I'm a hopeless fan, <laughs> somehow managed to make it to the playoffs. So here I am in a foreign city with no way to watch the American football game. So I turned to Twitter. Oh, and I Googled. I Googled to try to find sports bars. No luck. So I went to Twitter. And what I did is I did a location search. I searched for people within a 10-mile radius of Buenos Aires that were tweeting about the Bengals. And I found four or five people mentioning that they were watching the game. So I sent them a message. I said, hey, Brian, where are you watching the game at? <laughs> can, I, can I join you? Do you have a TV? So... I was able to, you know, find some fellow Bengal fans that we could uh, watch them lose, <laughs> and at the, and then at the same time make some new friends. So how can you use this as a financial professional? If you're having a wine tasting event, a golf outing, if you're doing these coaching seminars, find people in your local area and invite them. Do a location-based search with keywords. What hobbies might they have in common, and invite them to your events. Now on to Facebook, the giant. There's about 850 million people with Facebook accounts right now, and it's uh, predicted to go to a billion by the end of the year. One billion people on Facebook. Wow. Can we say it's the third largest country? It's about to be the largest country. I mean, it is growing fast. And there's two different types of accounts you can have on Facebook. There's your personal profile and your business account. So this is an example of a business account. This is Dan Caprill's angry capitalist here. There's nine million businesses that have active Facebook pages. Again, this is your business page. And you want to think about this. Think of Facebook like this giant shopping mall with a billion people in it. You want to have a storefront in this shopping mall. And that's what your business page is. Your personal profile is you working the store. You're in this mall too. You have a profile. And then your Facebook fan page is your business's presence in this mall. This is a personal page. It's very similar. Uh, they recently switched to these cover photos. And some people choose not to use Facebook. They're personal. They want to keep it all personal. But I think you're missing out on a big opportunity if you do that. There's ways where you can kind of do both. And that's what I've done, is I have different lists. I have my work people list. I have close friends. I have travel friends. And different people have access to different photos and different status updates. But the bottom line is what I, when you're, with your personal page, you want to talk, think about identifying your personal brand. Who is it? Who are you? What do you stand for? What are your values? For me, it's social connector, entrepreneur, and traveler. And my traveler has nothing to do with business or anything. It's something that's a value to me, and it's something I like to share and connect with my clients and prospects and community. So unless it is of interest or adds value to one of those three things, I don't post it. 
So I'm not out posting pictures of my lunch. <laughs> Unless I'm in Barcelona having paella. You know? So think about your personal values and make sure you're posting about things that are of interest or adds value to your brand. Now the business page. So this is the business page for the, uh, the book, The Main Street Money. So what you can see is very similar, but there's a lot more functionality and analytics within the business pages. You can share these more easily. So get on, like this page, share this on your Facebook page, share it with your clients, share it on your fan pages, get the word out. Because what happens when you like this, Everybody you're connected to can see that you like this. So it really creates a viral effect. So the, um, just you would go up into the search and type Mark Matson's Main Street Money and make sure you go on and like this. And again, so you can also, with the, the business pages, you have the ability to essentially build a website within Facebook. So you can build this dynamic website in this place where these people already are. And here's an example of that. So this is a page for another client we have. You can see it links directly to his Money Matters on NBC. It goes to, uh, you know, has a map of his business, has a photo of his office. So you can build these custom pages within your Facebook fan page. The average user spends more than 55 minutes a day on Facebook. It's a lot of time on Facebook. You want them to be seeing you. You want to be visible to these people. If you think that's not your clients, think again. The fastest growing demographic on Facebook right now, 55 to 65 year old females. Now, my mom is the perfect example of this. She's a baby boomer, 58. I remember five years ago when text messaging first started coming out, she said, oh, Amy, text messaging's for the kids. I'm not gonna text message. And sure enough, five years later, now I'm getting photo messages from her and my dad at the Cincinnati Bengals game. And the same was true of Facebook. Oh, Facebook, that's for the kids. I'm not gonna go on Facebook. Now she's on Facebook, has 100 friends. Oh, and her latest thing, she likes, she got an iPhone for Christmas. So she'll go and uh, she'll take photos of, of old family childhood photos and post them to Facebook. <laughs> so these boomers are getting on here and it's, and the boomers and seniors, and it's moving this direction. And you know, like Mark said earlier too, he was talking about, it's, they don't know what they want. They don't know what they need until it's there. And my mom never thought she needed Facebook. Now she loves it. Well, in this day and age of social media, Facebook texting, instant messaging, Maine seniors are not about to be left out in the cold. A large number of senior citizens are signing up to learn the latest and to get computer savvy so they can chat, message, chats, and pics. News agent Jim Keithley visited a seminar which is designed to help seniors set up a Facebook account. And he's here now with a closer look. Jim? Tracy, a lot of laughs and eager beavers in this class. A number of these seminars are being offered across the state, and they're filling up fast. There are even long waiting lists to get in. We went to the Portland Public Library where seniors were learning how to log on to Facebook. Wow, this is happening. There are long lines to get into these workshops. And here's a thought for you. I know you guys will do a lot of client appreciation events, you know, wine tastings, golf things. What if you did a Facebook education seminar for your clients? And you got them plugged into your Facebook page right there. And they're already connected and friends with you and getting all of your content. So think about some of these out of the box ideas because this is happening and there's a need for it. I was on the plane ride on the way down here. Look at the two baby boomers sitting next to me, plugging away on their iPad and uh, iPod. Like they are loving this and technology is just changing the way people communicate. I thought this was kind of funny. I don't always have a cool Facebook status, but when I do, an older relative ruins it with a lame comment. <laughs> Have any of you guys been that relative leaving messages? <laughs> yeah. I know my grandma, when I first, she first, my 90 year old grandma is on Facebook. And I remember she wrote some big long letter and posted it on my wall thinking it was a private message to me. <laughs> yeah, so you can delete it. I, I deleted it in the letter now. Now online, including social media, has become the most influential source in helping consumers make purchasing decisions. 
think about it. You know, you go to Amazon, you read the reviews, you ask your friends. If you're looking up a new car, you'll go and like read about what other people have to say. Buy any kind of technology. You're reading the reviews, you're trusting others. You know, it's building this trust. And with social media, you know, millions of people are putting content out there every day. You essentially become the media. If you're not getting picked up by the radio station, start your own online radio station and start doing podcasts. Not getting TV coverage, make your own TV station. I mean, Mark and Matt's and Money have done a great job of that with the Matt's and Money Live. But that's what social media is. You're creating content, you're putting out there, you're becoming the media. Rather than running an ad in a newspaper or on a radio station and renting their list, because that's what you're doing, you're renting their audience. Build your own audience that you can communicate to any time you want. We don't have a choice on whether to do social media. The question is how well we do it. Social media has fundamentally changed the way we communicate. Take a look at email. Email really only became mainstream among small businesses in the mid to late 90s. It's not very long ago, that's 15 years. Imagine where your business would be if you hadn't adapted to email. Communication has shifted again and it's happening twice as fast. 93% of social media users believe a company should have a presence on social media. But what does that mean? What kind of presence? Is it just taking the same advertising and messages and throwing it up there? No. People are on social networks to connect and learn more about you. They're not there to be marketed to and to have this stuff forced down your throat. You want to be personal and build these relationships. A really good example, Brian here last night was talking to us about his newsletter he sends out. He sends out a newsletter every quarter and he was saying that the only responses he ever really gets are people talking about, at the bottom of the newsletter he includes bits about his family and what they're up to. And that's the only thing people respond about is asking about his vacation photos or how his kids are doing. Because here's the secret, guys. Your clients actually like you. <laughs> they want to know about you. So share with them what's going on in your, li in your lives. Share with them your photos and build this relationship. And they're going to be less likely to leave you to go to some robot direct channel. So make sure you're adding the value. And you have to stop thinking campaigns and start thinking conversations. You need to engage with them, ask them questions, respond to them. Go on their Facebook page and wish them happy birthday. It's, and then Facebook makes it super easy. They tell you whose birthday it is. Just that little touch point can mean a lot, letting them know that you're, you're thinking about them. And it all comes back to building trust and creating this dialogue and becoming the expert. You've got so much great content. I mean, Matson gives you a lot of great stuff. You're experts in what you are. Share this with them. Educate them. Empower them. So how do you do that exactly? Well, it's about attract, convert, and transform. First, you need to attract the right type of people. Who are you trying to reach? What do they have in common? Where, what networks are they on? So let's get out there and attract the right kinds of people. So then you want to convert them. So you want to take these strangers and turn them into consumers of your content and ultimately clients. Then transform those stories in order to attract more clients. Oops. First, identify your target market. Who are you trying to reach? What 20% of your clients make up 80% of your revenue? What traits do they have in common? Do they collect antique cars? Are they golfers? Do they like wine? What do these people have in common? You have to think outside the box. Yes, everyone wants to connect with, you know, people that are 55 plus, close to retirement with a million dollars. With no, yeah, that's great. But what do those people have in common? Because on social networks, people share all of their hobbies and their likes. And if you find those out, you can find out how to connect with them. Next, set goals. You don't know where, you know, you're not going to know if you get there if you don't know where you're going. So you need to set goals 
Know what you're trying to achieve. And social media can help you with a plethora of different things here. Just look at all these. Pick one or two and focus on that. Everyone wants lead gen. Lead gen is great, but what about client retention? Like Mark said, these guys are falling off and they're going to different, um, you know, going direct. And that number was scary, how quickly that's grown. You can't just focus on getting new clients. You need to focus on keeping the ones you have by having a constant stream of communication. So know your goals and, and put those in place. Next is get out there and start connecting. You have to lay down the framework and the pipeline here. Start connecting with these people on the networks. So how do we do that? First, well, all of the networks in general allow you, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you can all import your email contacts. So start there, that's a great one. Import your personal email contacts, import your uh, work email contacts. The best base to start with is your current clients. Get connected to them first. Don't worry about getting out there prospecting. Connect with the, your clients and carry this conversation over. Don't just push it on social media when you have them in person and they're sitting down at the table with you. Talk about your Twitter and your Facebook and your LinkedIn and why that's an added value of working with you is to have this stream of constant communication and information and education that you're putting out there to them. So get out there and connect. Then go out and join groups and join fan pages, common interests, groups in your local area. You know, in Denver, there's like a, the Denver Historical Society. If you, um, people that are fans of the Denver Historical Society would likely be an older demographic, be potential clients. If you're an advisor in Denver, connect with the Denver Historical Society on Facebook. They have 1,500 members, all potential clients. Be present on that page. Get out there posting on that page. And that's a great way to create your exposure and to position yourself as an expert in front of these people. Connect with common interests, you know, golfing groups, skiing clubs, things like that. Get out and connect on these relationship things that you have in common because these personal touch points are something that cannot be replaced by technology or automation. Start your own fan page. I gave you the examples of the Facebook fan pages earlier. Make sure you get your clients connected to those pages. Start with what you have. Ask them to share it with their friends. Like I said, these people like you. They're working with you for a reason. And they want to tell their friends about how great you are and, and share that information. So make sure you're asking for it. And then with Twitter, it's all about following. There's over 300 million tweets a day on Twitter, and no one's even going to know you exist unless you start following them first. So figure out who you want to follow you, and go and follow them, and then catch their attention. Retweet what they have to say. Send them at messages. Essentially it's like, hi, look at me, pay attention, I'm right here. And then if they like what you have to say, they'll start following you back. So that's a great way to specifically target on Twitter and finding people in your local area. You can send them an app message before you're connected to his friends? Yep. It'll uh, tag them? Mm-hmm. You can... Now, now that we've laid the framework with getting the social network setting up, getting you plugged in and connected, we've laid the pipeline. Now it's time to start filling that pipeline with great content. Content is king. It's revolutioning marketing, actually. There's this whole new concept about content marketing because we've lost the trust factor. People just don't want you to tell them you're the best. They want you to prove it and prove it by the videos and your blogs and your articles and all of this great content. And Matson has provided you with so much great content. And it's fun working with a lot of you guys because it's, it's amazing what great information you have that we can share with the networks. So make sure you have strong content. Now where do you put that content? Well, it goes back to your website and your blog. You want to think of your blog as the hub of your social media campaign. 
And a blog and a website, these used to be two different things. But again, we're moving fast, and blogs and websites are now the same. The blog is at the heart of your website, pumping fresh content on a daily basis, giving people a reason to come back and visit your website again, to send their friends to your website. So this is an example of a well-optimized social media website. This is one that we did for Josh Wheeler. Uh, a couple things I want to point out. You can see the social media icons up top. They're prominent. He's got a, a nice video intro on here that talk, he, where he's talking, introducing himself. Below that, are, are you ready to invest? That's his blog right there on the home screen. So anytime he, he's sending that out, he can put it out on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn with a link coming back to this so they can read the full blog here. And then look, over to the right, sign up to receive your free investor awareness guide. Again, lead capture form. It's prominent. They enter their name, phone number, email. He's got a lead. If they don't convert now, it's someone to add to his mailing list. That he can continue to drip market and stay in front of these people. Because again, going back to what Mark said, it's about communication. You have to stay in front of these people communicating with them. A couple other websites. It's so another one we did. Look at the upcoming events and workshops. You can put your coaching workshops on here. Drive them back. Keep a centralized landing page where you can have them and you can push them to your upcoming workshops. So send out a link talking about your upcoming workshop and bringing them back here. And last, we have Mr. Hancock's website here. And the investor quiz, another great tool. Take advantage of this. Send people to this page. And something I'm sure you guys have noticed is all consistent on all these sites is that investor awareness guide. You've got that lead capture form right there where people can download it and they're entering their information and they become a lead. So that's how you really need to be utilizing your website. You know, these things need to be professional. 100 times as many people People are going to look at you online, your website, your social media profiles, then are ever going to set foot in your office. You know, you spend all this money making sure your office looks great and professional. You need to make sure you look professional online. Now, let's talk about the pink elephant in the room that a lot of the registered reps have probably been wondering about. Yeah, you mean this all sounds great, but Finner is not going to let me do this stuff. So we'll talk about compliance. Now I'm going to breeze over this pretty quickly because I know it can be a kind of a dry topic, but I just want to cover a couple high points here. FINRA realizes the importance of social media. They know that this is changing the way they communicate and it's not something they can hide from. They're embracing it. They've laid out... Uh, 1006 was a paper they put out in January of 2010. 1139 came out in August of last year. It just gives some framework for how to communicate within these social networks. And there's a couple key things you need to keep in mind is having a social media policy in place, having training in place, and understanding the difference between static content and interactive content. Interactive electronic forum. So they basically they break it into static content and in inter an interactive electronic forum. So what this means is anything interactive would be like status updates, any type of revolving content, which is the majority of your social media, blogs, as long as they're updated on a regular basis. So this all falls under interactive content. This doesn't require pre-approval. This requires archiving. It's the same as presenting in front of a live group of investors. So same suitability requirements apply, and you need to have archiving in place. There's a number of different companies out there, Smarsh, Arcovi, Socialware, Octiance, Hootsuite's about to jump on the market. So there's a bunch of places that can just plug in their API and automatically do this. So you don't have to keep records of everything. It's done for you. The other type of content is static content. And this does require pre-approval by a principal of the agency. So this would be things like your LinkedIn profile or your Twitter background image. So this stuff requires pre-approval. Now every broker dealer is different and is interpreting it differently. So check with your broker dealer, they're the ultimate authority, even though FINRA has laid out guidelines, so you need to find out what is allowed and not allowed. The background and the profile are static, and the content is interactive. But again, you're going to have to check with your broker-dealer because everyone has different regulations in regards to that. 
Um, we do have a social media compliance guide, which is available on our website. If you go to financial social media, you can download and gain access to that. Now, where does all of this fit into your overall marketing strategy? Yeah, Amy, all of this sounds great and it sounds overwhelming. Can you give me some things that I can just really start seeing and applying today with what I'm already doing? And that's what it's about. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Social media is about taking your current marketing message and amplifying it to reach a much larger audience through social media. So let's talk about four specific things here. Marketing an event, media exposure, strategic connections, and how to create an experience. First, let's talk about marketing an event. I know a handful of you guys uh, will do monthly wine tastings or things with your clients to get everyone together and things like that. So how would you promote this via social media? I know Dan Caprill has actually had a lot of success marketing these through LinkedIn. He had mentioned at one point that he was getting 25% of his attendance through invites he sent out on LinkedIn. Let's start with Facebook first. With Facebook, you want to create an event. So make an event on Facebook. Put the day, the time, the location, then start inviting people. Invite your friends. Share it on your wall. Share it on the Denver Historical Society wall. Share it on other local people. Maybe there's some CPAs locally that are also into social media. They have audiences you can market to. Do some exchange marketing there. So put the word out on Facebook. Also take photos at your event. So when the event's over, put the pictures up on Facebook. Tell them to come and tag themselves in the photos. You know, everyone that's tagged, say you tag 10 people. If 10 of those people are each connected to 100 people, that's 1,000 people in your local community. They can see this event, see how much fun it was, and help promote future events. Do you need permission? It, it, it's up to you. I, I, prefer, I usually would let them know at the event, let them know you're taking photos and they'll be posted on Facebook. You can tag them or you can ask them to come and tag themselves. Um, okay, so that's Facebook. Twitter. Like I said, we do the local search. Find people in your local area that are tweeting about wine, that have wine in their profile. So send them personal messages, little at messages inviting them. Uh, just post it in general on Twitter. Ask people to retweet it. All of these with a link. Either going back to that Facebook event or going back to your website and your calendar where they can learn more about this event and the information you have. LinkedIn, same thing. You can do a search. Search Atlanta. Wine. You can find these people and invite them and send them notes. You can go through their profiles and see if they're the right people you even want there. If, you, if they seem like a good prospect, send them a personal note. And it doesn't have to be individual for everyone. Create a general script. Scripts can be your best friend with these social networks. So just create a handful of scripts that you can throw in and out. So go in and invite them. Hey, you know, I noticed we're second degree connections on LinkedIn. And we, you, you have wine is something you enjoy in your profile. I'm having this event. Would love for you to come, bring a friend, blah, blah, blah. So get them to come to the event. And yeah, this can take some time to do this, but if you think about it, if you designate this, delegate this to an assistant or someone, you know, pay them $10 an hour, it's going to cost you a heck of a lot less than it would be to send out a direct mail piece to a bunch of random people. So it's a little more work, but it's working smarter and not harder. It's being strategic. Now, media exposure. This can both be for media exposure to get media exposure, if that's what you're looking for, or media exposure that you're already getting. So let's first start with Facebook. If you are getting covered in the press, sharing that on Facebook, posting it on YouTube with a link back to there, linking back to the news station's website, because that adds even more credibility. So sharing the media. If you're trying to get the media exposure, get in front of them. Go and like their page. Comment on their stuff. Be all over. And be under their nose so that when they need someone to interview, you're going to be the first one they think of because that name is going to be familiar to them because you're helping them out and you're engaging. Twitter. 
Same thing. What's great about Twitter, you said earlier, is that the fact that they don't have to follow you back. You can just send them messages. And ultimately, the media, they're trying to get exposures and get views and get people to see their articles. So if you're retweeting and helping them, and you know, say you come out with a new blog post, sharing that blog post with them. Hey, you know, I've got this great article, blah, blah. I worked for a magazine for seven years. These editors are starving for content. It is so easy to get press these days, especially online. You know, these guys, he went from having a magazine to all of a sudden having a daily newsletter, a weekly newsletter, online content, swamped. If you're providing valuable educational content, connecting with these people, finding them on LinkedIn. And then what I start out, I, I joke around, I say that I social media stalk people. <laughs> so what I'll do is if I want to talk to a particular editor or I want to speak at South by Southwest, which is something, is one of my goals next year, is I start out on LinkedIn. I go and I find all the decision makers, I connect with them on LinkedIn, I find their Twitter handles, I start following them on Twitter, I start retweeting their stuff, and it's a slow process. I don't approach them first with my content, I let them get familiar with me. I give them a couple months to see my status updates, realize who I am, and then I approach them and I start sending them articles. And it's been very successful. So that, that's just some strategic ways working with the media. Strategic connections, same thing. If you know particular people that you want to speak with, maybe it's CPAs that you're trying to connect with or estate planning attorneys. Think of these centers of influence and find them through the social networks. Facebook, going into the groups, finding these people on Facebook, friending them, or finding the centers of influence, and then it might be a local center of influence, friending all of their friends, because those could all be prospects. The key is you have to be particular when you do this. Give them messages. You have to say why you're friending them or linking to them and what value you're going to bring. For example, with LinkedIn, you could go in and say, to a group. You can say, hi Brian, I noticed we are second degree connections and both in the link to Denver group. I would like to add you as a friend or as your connection and I'm willing to help you out in any way I can to connect with my network. So it's who you are and why you want to connect. Now here's a couple examples. LinkedIn groups is a great way, connecting with groups in your local area on LinkedIn. So here's just an example of groups. Here I am on LinkedIn. What you can do is go into the groups category, click on groups, and you can search for groups in your local area. I'm living in Denver right now, so in this example I'm going to search for groups in Denver. So you just want to go in and you want to type in Denver here. And as you can see, it's going to bring up about 1,300 groups in the Denver area. That's a ton of people in your local area, right? Link to Denver, 15,000 people right there. Connecting to that group gives me access to all of those people. 5280, there's another 10,000 people. If I were to share a blog post with just those two groups, it has exposure to 25,000 local people. It's big. Or maybe you want to be more strategic. Look at this. Denver Bar Association. 600 attorneys right there. Maybe there's some estate planning attorneys that might have some interest in connecting with you. Go in these groups. Start communicating. Maybe you can add value to the conversation. Position yourself as an expert. This is another really fun one. Oh, this is this is one of the best LinkedIn features, is the companies. You can go into LinkedIn companies and actually search for and follow companies in your local area. So in this example, I chose Cincinnati. So I'm searching for companies that are in Cincinnati. I chose all industries, but then down there I chose company size. So in this one I searched for companies between, uh, what is that, 50 and 200 employees. There's 255 companies in Cincinnati with that many people. I sorted it by relationship. So starting out, I'm, there's 18 people in my network in that first one. But what you want to do is you want to connect with these companies. And the great thing is once you get connected to them, you can actually be sent an email anytime somebody leaves or joins that company. What do people usually have left over when they leave a company? A exactly. So this is a great way to be notified 
when those 401ks are going to be abandoned. So this is another great tool. So it's knowing how to use these networks strategically that's going to help you excel. Create an experience. You hear this a lot. You know, your office, when you come in, you want to have photos on the wall and you want to, um, you know, maybe have... Well, you guys can't have the testimonials. <laughs> but you want to have you want to have this experience that they go through where they see you as this expert and they see your degrees on the wall and you want to have this great environment. So how do we take that same experience and put that online? Taking those same photos and sharing them on your Facebook fan page of your client events of your family. These people want to know you. They have quest they like you. They like your family. You don't have to share everything, but just if you go on a trip, they're going to want to know about your trip. Share a couple photos and take all of this online. And here's the, someone doing a good example of that with uh, in the, with the stories and the pages here is Brian is doing this on YouTube. He's got a really great uh, YouTube channel every um, every week he's doing a couple two-minute videos. They're filmed in his office. So it's taking these people, letting him see the inside of his office. He's very open with his communication. He's very direct. It shows his personality in these videos, and his clients love it. So taking this experience, and it's really easy to do. You should talk to him about it. He just has a, you know, a microphone and a video camera. He's got it set up. And real easy just to shoot these and load them up to YouTube. But the marketing power is, can be extremely powerful. So these are all some really good examples of what, taking what you're already doing and translating them into these online areas. An chronically leaking boat, energy devoted to changing vessels is more productive than energy devoted to patching the leaks. Warren Buffett. This could not be more true, guys. What worked 10 years ago doesn't work anymore. The boat is sinking. The same things you've been doing, you can't just keep throwing more money at it. It's not going to fix it. It's time to change boats. And that new vessel is the internet and online and technology. And Mark made a statement earlier, a prediction. He said in 15 years, He's predicting that 15% of you guys will be left. Are you going to be one of that 15%? Are you going to sink with the ship? It's a decision that you guys need to make. Kind of wraps it up. I just want to talk to you. Again, this, a lot of this is overwhelming. That's, this is something that we can help you out with. My company, Financial Social Media, we do websites. Everything you saw designed, the stuff that we put together, we do websites. We do social media startup packages, turnkey management. We have a, a bunch of services that we can offer you. This is outside and external from what, and above and beyond what Matson already provides you. They're a little bit restricted by compliance, by how much they can provide, and that's where we come in. There's some information in the packets, and you can find myself or Amanda if you have questions about any of this. And then I just wanted to end this with some questions. Do any of you guys have some questions that you would like to ask? Do you think it's necessary for the Facebook personal or business to be separate? Oh, hold on. I'll get you a second first. I got a couple of questions about uh, the searches and the messages on LinkedIn. Do you have to go to the uh, the paid version or the pro version to send messages and or do searches by location? And also on Twitter, how do you do searches by location? Uh, on LinkedIn, to send the messages, you do have to go to the advanced feature to do the searches. That's through the regular feature. So there is a, there's a, some different advanced LinkedIn. But if you're connected to these people, you can send them messages for free. And you can send them messages for free also if, you have, if, if you're in the same group as them. So that's what I'll do. I'll find out what groups they're in, and I'll go join the groups, and I can send them messages. <laughs> um, and then as far as Twitter goes, it's advanced Twitter search. So you can go into the advanced Twitter search, and you can type location. You can do within like a certain mile radius. There's all sorts of things you can do on Twitter. So it's just knowing the advanced Twitter search and features. Is there a question? 
It has to do with Twitter. I'm on it. Um, but one of the things that seem to get spam, I get a lot of, hi, I'm Candy, I'd like to meet you. <laughs> and, it, and I get a ton of, you know, I just go through and delete it, but it seems like I get an awful lot. Is there a filter on there that you can put on to keep this from happening, or is it just a byproduct of it? Yeah, you, you can and make I'm not it. getting to know Candy. I know. Well, but do you know why she's following you? Because she's doing the same thing that you should be doing to other people. She sees you as a potential prospect. Oh, God. So she's, <laughs> she's trying to get out there and get in front of you so that she's visible, which is what you need to be doing to you know your clients. You want to be visible and get in front of them. <laughs> she's visible, and you should see what she posts. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Amy, I got one back here. Um, just a couple of thoughts because I've been doing this for a little while on the whole social media thing. And you know, first of all, this is not a choice. You guys got to do this. I mean, this is like email, like you said, 15 years ago. I mean, I explicitly remember other advisors telling me that their clients wouldn't use email and they just weren't going to, you know, worry about it. And you know, overnight that you know, just happened and it's like, you know, we don't even use fax machines anymore, how that technology changes. So you have to do it. I get a lot of people calling me about this and, you know, I will tell you that you will get business from it almost right away, but it is not in and of itself to be a big business maker. It is designed, first of all, to keep in contact with your existing clients. It's those daily touches that we have to do. Where the business that I've gotten has come from it has been really from a lot of old friends who, as a rule, I don't solicit to friends, but they know what I do now more than they ever did because I don't spend time at parties telling them what I do, but they could find it through social media, and then they would call me. I mean, I just got my trainer's mother the other day coming in, and I've never talked to my trainer about what I do. But he saw my, what I did, and his mother was going through a divorce, and the next thing I know, she called me, you know, and, and I asked him, I go, well, how did you know I did this? And he goes, well, because you're, you're on my Facebook and you're always talking about stuff. <laughs> so that's where you're going to get it. But the, the touches are, are the key to your existing clients. And that's really what I did because in 2008, you know, I was upset about, well, even before 2008, but I was upset about two things. I was upset that clients were panicking and I was upset that, that people were blaming the free market system for it. And that really ticked me off. And so that's how that whole, you know, epiphany came about, you know, doing that whole AC thing. But um, the other thing I would tell you is don't kid yourself. You cannot do this alone. You have got to hire a consultant to do it. You do, if you're spending the amount of time necessary to do this, you're not going to be able to do the rest of your job. So for what is less than the cost of one client, hire a very competent consultant like Amy to do this for you. And they'll do it all. They'll write your blogs. They'll, they'll build your population. When we do a wine tasting now, I send, a, I send an email via LinkedIn to everybody, and I can, I, can, I can narrow the list. So I send it to people in the local area, um, and uh, I invite them all. And yeah, usually if we get about, if we get about our, our wine tasting, the room's small. We can only hold 24 people. We're averaging between four and six of those people are from LinkedIn. And these people I don't even know. All I know is you know, what they do for a living. But, you know, it was a hell of a lot cheaper than doing it on, you know, v via mail. So it, it, it's not in and of itself going to replace any, everything that I'm doing. It's, it's just one more thing we have to do. And if you don't do it, you, you're just kidding yourself. You're, you're going to get passed by and because uh, things are just happening too quickly. But, but you've got to do it the right way. And the right way is hiring somebody who can do that time. And really, for what the cost is and what maybe you, you get for one or two clients, for a year, heck of a lot cheaper than hiring an employee to do it for you. So, just a few thoughts. Appreciate that, Dan. Hi, Amy. Hi. The work and the design work that you do on our websites, uh, we own the domain, so we own the content. We've got a lot of control. Uh, I would be concerned about the work that and the design work that you would do uh, for us that's up in the cloud and something that we don't own and don't have any control over. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, for instance, Facebook just changed their rules March 30th with the whole timeline thing. Mm -hmm. So you design something and then all of a sudden, you know, they change it on you. So what happens there? Well, you know, it changes, it's about adapting. You know, if you're a monthly client with us, we'll go ahead and we'll update and make the changes for you if you're, you know, on retainer and we're managing on a monthly basis. But you're right, Facebook does change, and Twitter changes, and Twitter changed recently too. Uh, but you do own the property, you own the graphics, and you can always go in and change those. So you have total control over it. You can control your privacy settings. You had, you had mentioned um, about Facebook, and what, what could you give us a little more distinction between personal and business? How important is it 
to either integrate the two or have a separate page for each. And then also, you mentioned there were three things that you want to make sure. I just I missed the, those, if you could repeat them. Um, well, with the Facebook, the fan page is your business's presence. That's your storefront. You definitely need to have a Facebook fan page. Your personal profile, you can either choose to use that for all personal or a combination of personal and business. I do not recommend having two separate personal Facebook profiles, one for business, one for not business. It's too much work. Nothing's going to happen. You just need to face the fact that social media and technology has blurred the lines between business and personal. So divide it up with lists. That's what I do. Is I have different lists that have access to different photo albums, status updates. And it's more, and it's not that I'm like putting anything crazy or bad on there that I wouldn't, wouldn't want clients to see, but I wouldn't want to bore them with something that maybe my college buddies would like, but you know, that wouldn't be interesting to everybody. So you have to keep in mind, you want to keep things of interest and adds value. And then I was talking too about establishing your personal brand. Think about what is it that you stand for, and that's what you should be communicating. Amy, uh, over here, sorry. Uh, I'm curious about uh, the websites dedicated to reviews, confidential or anonymous reviews. Um, and I understand the issue with testimonials and the kind of worry in this industry and others I'm involved in. But it seems like consumers will go to reviews and believe those, even though it's all a bunch of anonymous reviews, rightly or wrongly. I'm wondering if you have anything that you help manage those review sites or attract information to get your reviews out there, if you understand the question. I mean, I, 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 there's a distinction between a review that someone submits without me asking versus a testimonial, I believe. Now, I'm speaking as a lawyer, I, I suppose. but. Mm -hmm. um, do, do you agree with that? Yes. Okay. There, there is a difference between testimony and review. Okay. For example, with a, you know, almost, a, well, I guess it would be a testimonial too. But if somebody posts it on their own personal Facebook page, there's nothing anyone can do about it. I can't stop that. No, you can't. Good, bad, or indifferent. Mm -hmm. There's nothing you can do to stop that. There are a couple sites out there, Tippy Bob, FiPath, Brightscope. There's these different websites now that are um, taking, allowing people to do anonymous reviews or reviews on a Advisors, and the, the reason that's allowed is because the advisor has no control over it. It's all third party, so it has to accept bad reviews and good reviews. And since the advisor has zero control, those are allowed. Versus LinkedIn, you guys are not allowed to have any kind of reviews on LinkedIn because that's considered a testimonial, and you choose whether that goes public or not. So if it's bad, you can just choose to hide it. Um, is that answering what you're well, looking for? I, I, we, I was, we were at a session last week that was talking about uh, getting those reviews and making it easy for your tribe, your happy clients, to get those on the web so that when someone goes, the positive reviews will overwhelm those few that are negative. Does that make sense? Yeah, do, yeah, do you know, like, where are they posting I have those? no idea. Go Google review is what I understood. Under It's under a Google program. But okay. Google Plus, maybe? From what I've, uh, you know, understood mostly is that reviews and testimonials are still... Com combined in the same word. Still okay, combined in the same... Unless, like I said, like, there's those new networks, Tippy Bop and things that are coming out, where you're allowed to have reviews because you don't have control over it. So it's still a very gray area. Okay, thank you. What are the names again? Tippy Bob, Brightscope, FiPath. Uh, yeah, no, F I P A T H. Brightscope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are different things. Another question? Uh, Amy, I don't know exactly how to answer this, uh, ask the question, but it might be of a couple of parts. Uh, the first part uh, being, where does all the personal information go that's out there on Facebook? And number two, of a lot of publications I read in various business magazines, Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, there seems to be some taint that personal information is being mined for political reasons on Facebook because of the gentleman's political ambitions. Mm -hmm. Any comments on that? If you don't want it out there, don't put it out there. I mean, you can have controls over your privacy settings to an extent, and you can control you know, people searching you and seeing it. 
But ultimately, you know, behind the scenes, Facebook could be taking and selling your information. Wow. Even though they say they're not now, you never know. So, you know, be aware that what you're putting out there, while you may be able to delete it, it could potentially always be on file and record. So just know that going into all of this. Are there any more? Thank you. Um, in terms of hiring somebody like you where you would be adding fresh content on a regular basis, how logistically does that work in terms of from a compliance perspective or from a customization perspective? Is it generic? How it's a combination of, of multiple things because on Facebook you want to be putting out, Facebook and LinkedIn, one to two status updates a day. Twitter, you want to be doing more. Twitter is like a radio station. Different people are listening at different times. You can, you can repeat messages. You want to be putting out you know, five or six posts a day on Twitter. So it's about putting this content out there. Uh, what we do is you know we, we work with uh, we assign a project manager to an in particular advisor they work with you on a personal basis so about 50% of it is group content that we use for multiple clients and the other uh, I would say 30% is personal for you working with you on what upcoming events do you have this month that you're trying to promote what's going on in your office so it's very personal and then about 20% of it will pull in RSS feeds uh, from you know popular Financial Times, things like that, and we'll plug those into usually your Twitter account because that's hard to populate with fresh content, so we utilize the RSS feeds. And then so that 30%, I guess, would have to go through compliance first, or how does that typically work in your experience? No, it, it depends on your broker-dealer. So some broker-dealers say everything has to be pre-approved. Okay. I think that is going to change in the next year because there's no way you can pre-approve everything. You lose the real-time effectiveness of uh, social media. Media. Uh, majority are requiring post review and blogs go either way half of them want pre-review so in the beginning of the month we'll send you four blogs you can get those pre-reviewed and then we'll post them or it requires the post review archiving in which you sign up or we can set you up we have our Kobe is who we use for our social media archiving or a lot of times the broker dealers require you to go through who they are using thank you uh, how much of a book can we uh, do an excerpt on? Obviously, you know, if it's 100 pages, we're not going to put 100 pages and say it was written by Joe Schmo, but a page and say credited by uh, or credit to this is from Joe Schmo from his book. And here's a page of it. Is that copyright infringement? Is that, you know, you know stuff like that. 200 words. You can put 200 words verbatim, and then you need to supply a link to the original source. So, and if you do any images or graphics, you can put the graph, like the infographics or things like that, you can put those on there, but you need to link to the original source. So and as how long about as you're like linking. PDFs that you find on, on other sites that, that make it publicly available? Could you uh, download that and put that on your website and, and not alter it at all? Or do we have to link it back? Or how does that work? I would recommend contacting them specifically because of a lot of those require you to maybe enter your email address to download it so they're getting that lead and then if you're just giving it away for free they're not getting that lead gen that they're looking for so that's some things there what about uh, the same thing regarding music that you might use in just little snippets of music uh, clips in your videos sort of like you did in your presentation you know I'm not sure about the music so I, I, I don't feel comfortable answering that. I know that was um, a video from Socialnomics. I don't know if you noticed at the end it had Socialnomics. It's uh, publicly available on YouTube. So if it's something that's publicly available, that's fine. But as far as custom creating and incorporating music into your own videos, I believe there would probably be some copyright concerns that you should check into. Any other questions? In, in regards to um, Brian's upload or weekly upload, I know when I was audited, um, a presentation I did for 401k clients, they said, hey, that's advertising. You need to submit that and get that approved. And I said, well, I'll do a couple different ones for clients. It's going to change. And they said, yeah, you need to submit that each time. So I'm kind of visualizing what Brian's doing, an extension of that. Have you run into states or 
where your clients would have to get that pre-approved each time? A, a newsletter pre-approved? Or? Uh, an upload like Brian was doing. Oh, the videos? Yes. I, it, it depends. Well, it, it hasn't been the states. It's been uh, more on the broker-dealer side. I haven't ever had any. Yeah, as an RIA, mm-hmm. that, that's what I ran into. They were saying, all right, whatever your presentation. I said, it's, it's education. And they said, no, but it's a form of advertising. So I just see those parallels. No, I've never run into that. And I would hold with your guns. I mean, it is education. You're not... I mean, you're, you're providing this information for them. You're empowering the consumer. You're teaching them. So. But just do it and ask for forgiveness later, right? <laughs> I think you need you take, use your own judgment on that. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Well, all of you guys, if you're interested in any of the services we have or a free 20-minute consultation, there's forms. If you want to go ahead and fill this out with your name and information and check anything that you're interested in, uh, I'll be collecting those. You can just leave.